Jewish channels we can review. How did Edan Pinchot fare on America's Got Talent? A Jewish young man beaten in Michigan. Was it anti-Semitism? Helping young children with serious medical concerns. And more of the Jewish news that's changing your world right now in this episode of the Week in Review. Hello and welcome to the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. Was a young man in Michigan beaten in an anti-Semitic attack? Statements from the college student and his parents differ from those offered by local police in a story spread widely but inaccurately last week. Zachary Tennant is a 19-year-old student at Michigan State. He was admitted to a hospital last week with a broken jaw after being beaten at an off-campus party. He had emergency surgery to have his jaw wired shut and is now recuperating at home. Tennant's initial statement to police made some very specific claims about the nature of the assault and the motivations of his attackers. Tennant and his parents' statements to police and the press claim that Tennant was approached by two young men with shaved heads and asked if he was Jewish. The statements claim the two men performed a Nazi salute and declared Heil Hitler, then knocked Tennant unconscious. One particular claim about the assault that spread widely in the hours after the initial reports seems never to have been actually made by Tennant or his family members, and that is the claim that Tennant's mouth was stapled shut. Tennant and his parents do claim that he was attacked with a stapler while unconscious and that his attackers, quote, stapled me in the backside of my bottom teeth, starting in my gums and going upwards. However, the local police department is asserting a somewhat different version of events and says it does not have sufficient evidence to suggest that hate crime charges are likely. Specifically, the police department claims the two witnesses to the assault saw it unfold without key anti-Semitic elements mentioned by Tennant. I don't think this victim is lying or anything like that. It's just some difference of what these people saw, East Lansing Police Captain Jeff Murphy told the Detroit Free Press, adding they've got front row seats to this whole thing and he got assaulted and it never should have happened and it was a serious assault, but the big thing is people started putting out it was a hate crime and nothing showing us it was a part of it. According to the police department, the two witnesses never saw a Nazi salute or heard references to Hitler or to Tenen's Jewishness. The witnesses also said they saw no attack with a stapler and that the entire assault consisted of one punch to the face from a single assailant before the assailant walked away. And where Tennant said no one at the party helped him during or after the beating, the witnesses said that those at the party helped him up, gave him frozen items for his face, called him a cab for transport to the hospital, and helped him to that cab. Police have an 18-year-old male in custody whom they describe as being, quote, cooperative. Tennant's father has said police claims that a hate crime did not occur are, quote, absurd. But one recent attack in Germany is being universally recognized as the result of anti-Semitism and leading to bold displays of solidarity with local Jews. Rabbi Daniel Alter was reportedly walking in Berlin with his six-year-old daughter when he was approached by four men who asked if he was Jewish, then threatened both the rabbi and his daughter before assaulting the rabbi, who was hospitalized with a broken cheekbone. In the wake of the attack, an official at a local Jewish seminary suggested rabbinical students should not wear yarmulkes so as to avoid being targeted. Non-Jewish Germans gathered in a display of solidarity on Saturday, with more than 1,000 appearing in Berlin, all wearing yarmulkes. Among those spotted wearing yarmulkes both at the rally and elsewhere were the mayor of Berlin and members of parliament. Leading local newspaper Berliner Zeitung covered the show of solidarity on its front page, declaring Berlin wears a kippah, accompanied by photos of leading figures donning the Jewish skullcaps. Moving on to one of the most shocking assaults against a Jew in recent decades, the assassination of Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin in 1995 at the hands of a fellow Israeli Jew. One of the co-conspirators in that crime and the brother of the man who pulled the trigger was released from jail in May after serving a 16-year sentence. He gave an exclusive online chat interview this week to 972 Magazine's Ami Kaufman, in which he expressed no regret for the crime, called it a, quote, mitzvah, and said he would have committed the crime himself if his brother Yigal Amir had failed to do so. Asked if he feels any remorse, Amir responded, quote, of course not. It didn't happen just out of the blue. We thought about it for two years, we acted according to Jewish halakha, and one must not regret doing a mitzvah. The Rabin assassination was inspired by and has continued to inspire so-called price tag attacks from Israeli right-wing extremists. An act of vandalism against the West Bank Monastery this week fit that pattern. The monastery in Latrun was spray-painted with names of communities that the Israeli government has declared illegal outposts. 
One of those, Migron, was evacuated by police this week. Inside the monastery, the vandal spray-painted the message, Jesus is a monkey. A sort of spokesman for this segment, Baruch Marzel, told the Jerusalem Post after the vandalism, We said the evacuation of Migron would raise the anger and burning incitement from a public who feels embittered, adding, I hope that in the future the government and courts will avoid steps that only strengthen the polarization in the country and lead to price tag attacks. Moving on to a story here in the United States of a young Jew Jewish teen who is being celebrated for his positive achievements. One of America's highest rated TV shows is America's Got Talent, and one yarmulke wearing young man made it to the top 24 semifinalists on that show, as we reported last week. Edan Pinchot didn't make it to the select group of six who will be finalists, but he's nonetheless grateful and pleased to have had the experience, as Rebecca Honig Friedman reports with an exclusive interview. Just minutes after finding out that he was eliminated from the competition at America's Got Talent, the 14-year-old piano-playing and singing sensation Edan Pinchot walked to the red carpet wearing his signature yarmulke and a brave face. I mean, obviously I'm disappointed about getting out, but it's been such an amazing experience and such an amazing journey. Um, I've really just enjoyed every second of it. Edan was one of 24 semifinalists who made it through multiple auditions and rounds of competition to get to this point. He performed in the first half of the semifinals episodes of America's Got Talent, where 12 contestants were whittled down to just three, based on a popular vote, singing the hit song What Makes You Beautiful by British boy band One Direction. Idan got a standing ovation from the crowd and judges Howie Mandel and Sharon Osbourne, but Judge Howard Stern was more critical. I'm going to be very honest with you that I was a little bit bored by that song. Yeah. Idan said he had no hard feelings for Stern, however. Um, I definitely don't blame him. I mean, I think that he has a lot of good constructive criticism for everyone. Um, at the end of the day, there was a ton of amazing talent last night, and I mean... It was just whoever got through would have been amazing. He also stood by his performance. I thought my song choice was right. Um, I think between the artists and kind of just the fan base, I mean, everything fit for me. Um, you can't really please everyone, so. True enough, but Idan did manage to please a whole lot of people. What do you like about Idan? He was just like very inspirational that he was so young and that, yeah. Yeah. And then he sang One Direction and One Direction <laughs> Rocks, you know. He was so adorable and he sang my favorite song. I was uh, very impressed. So was Howie Mandel. I'm on the Jewish Channel. And with more than just Idan's talent. Oh, I love that he was there with the yarmulke. I, you know, I have nothing but the ut utmost respect for our religion and somebody who's willing to be who they are on stage and not, you know, uh, bend to what they think might make them more popular. Shows a strength in character and a strength in their soul that makes me proud to be a Jew. This season, all three judges on America's Got Talent just happened to be Jewish, including Stern. Lisa G. of Howard 100 News said she refers to her boss as, quote, the head Jew. Yes, that's what I call him. Yes, he is my rabbi. But Idan said that being an observant Jew hasn't been much of an issue on the show. I think that people have kind of learned to accept me for who I am, and they've kind of just realized that this is what I am, and this isn't, I'm not really going to change for anything. So what's next for this talented teen? For right now, I'm just going to kind of settle down a little bit, um, but... I think that in the future you could definitely expect some more original music and some more original stuff coming. And then, of course, there's high school to conquer. From Idan's active Twitter feed, where he has picked up thousands of followers, it appears this phenom is getting back to life as usual. Reporting for the Jewish Channel from the red carpet of America's Got Talent, I'm Rebecca Honig Friedman. Thank you, Rebecca. More than 180 young people affected by serious medical difficulties were cheered up by a recent effort, as Christian Neiden reports. A group of young Jews assembled at Newark International Airport recently to help conquer their illnesses through adventure. They were embarking on a trip to the West Coast for an adventure camp run by Kids of Courage, a volunteer-based nonprofit group that organizes trips for young people with serious medical conditions. 
This particular trip featured 150 youth, aged 5 to 24 years old, flying to Los Angeles for nine days of summer fun, accompanied by volunteer counselors and medical staff on a large, medically outfitted plane, specially chartered by United Airlines for the occasion. Kids of Courage Medical Director Dr. Stuart Dichek explained why he helped found the group four and a half years ago. There was a need for individuals like this who didn't have the opportunity to travel, not only in the summer, but year-round as well. So we ski with them in the winter, we go to the West Coast in the summer, we do weekends, Shabbatons throughout the year uh, at different communities, different Jewish communities all over the country. Uh, and we recognized that if they didn't have us, they would just sit at home. One of those on the flight was 12-year-old Racheli Hertzfeld from Teaneck, New Jersey. The idea of these trips is just to have like like an awesome time and just like and just like cure illness through like adventure. So it's like really fun. And last year for the summer trip, we went to San Francisco, and that was so much fun. We went to all these muse um, amusement parks and water parks and baseball games. And like the, the kind of idea just to like distract you from your disability and just have an awesome time. To hear more about Kids of Courage, please tune in to the full broadcast edition of the Week in Review. Thank you, Christian. Finally, so much of what we hear about Israel vaguely refers to matters in the world of intelligence, or what we might more casually declare spying. Meredith Gansman discovered this week some of the history behind what's so often called the spy game. I've always been fascinated with the world of the spy, the secrets, the gadgets, the inner intelligence, and now today I have my chance to experience this espionage firsthand. It's my mission, if you will, should I choose to accept it. What most of us know about spying comes from the movies, but a new exhibit at Discovery Times Square reveals the real world of espionage to be more complex than just heroes and villains. And Jews have long been a part of this covert profession. Jewish history is replete with examples of espionage. Going back to when Moses sent the spies to spy the promised land. Then there were the more contemporary spies. The Rosenbergs killed for treason and more recently Jonathan Pollard who is serving a life sentence in jail for passing classified U.S. information to Israel. H. Keith Melton, an expert in the world of espionage, explained the importance of Israel's intelligence services. Good intelligence may often be more powerful than 5,000 men on the battlefield and I think the Jewish state going back into biblical times has always realized that. Now Israel has two of the most powerful intelligence services in the world. Your Mossad, which is a external service, your Shin Bet, which is the internal security service, and Amman, which is your military intelligence services. With its dangerous circumstances and notorious characters, the world of the spy has always had a glamorous appeal. Now from the movies they see that James Bond is about assassination and seduction. Mm -hmm. What they're gonna see, that in reality, it's far more intricate. It's about information, it's about communication, it's about gadgets that help people communicate secretly, it's how disguises really work, and it's the stories of real people and real events that have changed our history and arguably are in use today that are changing tomorrow's headlines. For the first time, audiences have access to the tricks of the espionage trade. The curator of Spy, the secret world of espionage, Melton took me through artifacts from the CIA, FBI, and his own personal collection, from hidden cameras to one of the world's smallest submarines. This is the MSC class Sleeping Beauty and it was the world's smallest operational spy submarine in World War II. Wow. And it was used to get a saboteur beneath an enemy's submarine nets. To see how I complete my spy training, tune into the full broadcast version of the Week in Review. Thank you, Meredith. That's all for this week from all of us here at the Jewish Channel. Be well. The Jewish Channel is available on cable. Time Warner Cable Channel 528, IO Optimum Channel 291, RCN Channel 268, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, Cox Channel 1, Frontier Communications, and now on Comcast Cable in the on-demand menu under Premium Channels. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.